21st century businesses need 21st century infrastructure. Modern ports and stronger bridges, faster trains, and the fastest internet. Democrats and Republicans used to agree on this. Another Republican president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, initiated the last truly great national infrastructure program, the building of the interstate highway system. The time has come for a new program of national rebuilding. Tonight, I'm calling on Congress to produce a bill that generates at least $1.5 trillion for the new infrastructure investment that our country so desperately needs. Not one, not two, not three, but many US presidents have called attention to the country's infrastructure problem. A problem that, believe me, could weigh heavily on the competitiveness, the future, and above all, the security of the United States. While huge amounts of money are invested into modern infrastructure in Asia and Europe, as well as into the maintenance of existing facilities, in the United States, many of them, especially in the area of transportation, are in a state of disrepair. In fact, the country with the world's largest economy does not even make it into the top 10 countries for the average quality of its infrastructure, where, surprise surprise, only Asian and European countries are ranked. Even if it holds 13th place, it is more because of the enormous amount of infrastructure in the country, rather than the current state of repair of the infrastructure or its future viability. So although it may be surprising, in the world's leading power, it is quite usual to have to drive on roads full of potholes, railway accidents are not uncommon, and bridges that fall down due to lack of maintenance happen far more often than you would expect in a country with so many economic resources. In this video, we analyze the key factors underpinning the great infrastructure problem in the United States, and how the current occupant of the White House, Joe Biden, intends to solve it. And pay attention, because the new president's plan is far from being the plan that we would have imagined, nor is it the plan we probably would have wished for. As all of you who support us on Patreon already know, because we have covered it on several occasions in our weekly snapshot. The United States is facing a severe budget imbalance that is already leading to measures such as the largest tax increase since 1993. And with this move, Washington has not spent a lot of time wondering how to finance it. By the end of the video, you will understand why I say this. So, are you ready for this journey through the infrastructure of the great American power? Well, let's get started. A multi-million dollar ruin. Infrastructure in the United States is very bad. We've already said that, but exactly how bad is it? For example, if you drive on Wisconsin roads, you better start preparing a budget for new tires and shocks because 81.7% of all roads there are in poor condition. On the other hand, if you were thinking of setting up an auto repair shop in the United States, you already know which state to head to. Then if you dare to take a train in the state of New Jersey, make sure you've taken out decent healthcare insurance beforehand because between 2015 and 2019 alone, there were no fewer than 104 derailments or 10.9 per 100 miles of track. And if by any chance you need to go over a bridge in Rhode Island, you better bring your lucky charm because two out of 10 bridges in that state have structural deficiencies. And what I'm giving you are just three examples. But the truth is that at the national level, 21.8% of the miles and miles of roads and 7.6% of the bridges are in poor condition. These figures are certainly not typical of a developed country, much less of the world's leading economic power, a problem that also causes potential losses for the national economy because it undermines the competitiveness of companies. Crumbling infrastructure is hurting America's competitive edge, industry weak. And not only that, it is estimated that at least $786 billion are needed to repair and update roads and bridges alone. And that's only for repairs, not for capacity expansions or anything else. Simply to make existing infrastructure safe again and to enable them to do what they were designed to do. What's more, if you thought I was exaggerating before when I told you to get your wallet ready for new wheels and shocks, nothing could be further from the truth. According to estimates by the American Society of Civil Engineers, US motorists spend $130 billion each year on repairs to their vehicles due to poor road conditions. That's one sixth of all the money it would take to bring the roads and bridges up to date every year. So no matter which way you look at it, austerity in road maintenance is an expense rather than a saving for many drivers in the form of repairs and the need for more frequent maintenance on their vehicles. 
But that is not the end of the story. If the ground infrastructure is in a state of disgrace, the air infrastructure is not far behind either. Most US airports are stuck in the 1970s and the 1980s. They were once among the best, but the lack of upgrades, modernizations, and expansions has made the United States one of the richest countries with the most antiquated and congested airports on the planet. In fact, not one, not a single US airport makes the list of the world's top 25 airports. And no wonder, many major US airports such as New York's JFK in pre-pandemic conditions are too congested. And of course, that translates into delays, which in turn translates into economic losses in the millions for airlines and a lower quality of service for passengers. But at this point, the question I'm sure many of you are asking is, why on earth is this still the case? Why is the infrastructure in the United States so deficient? Well, let's find out. Houston, we have a problem. To understand why US transportation infrastructure is so bad, we have to talk a little bit about politics, a little bit about history, and of course, a little bit about money. And since we are at Visual Politics, let's start naturally with politics. In the United States, as you will know, there are two major parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Well, both parties are in favor of improving transportation infrastructure, but don't get too excited because they don't usually agree on how exactly to go about it. The biggest problem is at the federal level, that is the central government's investment, which must be previously approved by Congress. And of course, Republicans believe that money from an infrastructure plan should be focused primarily on improving and building roads and highways so that people can easily get places in their own cars. Democrats, on the other hand, believe that funds should be focused more on boosting a good rail and public transportation network. It is the never-ending battleground in the war between individualism and collectivism, but taken perhaps to the ridiculous. Improving roads so that everyone can easily get to places is freedom for some and something unsustainable and a throwback to the past for others. For some, promoting trains or public transport is almost a socialist approach because it would mean controlling the movement of people. And for others, it is nothing less than the future of sustainable mobility. The fact is that this ongoing debate means that, in the end, there will never be a budgetary agreement to launch a comprehensive plan endowed with sufficient funds to fix and update the country's infrastructure. And that is why, as we said at the beginning, all the presidents try, but in the end, no one succeeds. And take note, because the other added problem is that most of the US transportation infrastructure network was built in a relatively short period of time, between the 1950s and the 1970s. And of course, that means that when it comes to aging, the whole network is more or less on the same time frame. But that's only the beginning of the problems. Right now, it's time to talk about money. Highway maintenance and construction in the United States can come from two sources, the states and local authorities on the one hand and the federal government on the other. The latter finances its contribution through what is known as the Highway Trust Fund. <laughs> This is a fund that is fed by the federal fuel tax, which has been frozen since 1993 at 18.4 cents per gallon of gasoline and 24.4 cents per gallon of diesel. However, this model has three major problems. The first is that the tax, being a fixed amount instead of a percentage and not having been updated since 1993, has already diminished to only half of the real tax burden based on the price level and inflation in 1993. The second problem is that with the advance in increasingly efficient vehicles and the appearance of electric cars, the consumption of fossil fuels in relation to the number of vehicles circulating on the roads has dropped significantly. And with it, the capacity for financing through this tax is also lower. The outcome is that for some time, the Highway Trust Fund has had to receive money from the public treasury, that is to say, from other taxes. Although in insufficient amounts and in opposition to the nature for which this fund was created in 1956, which was basically to finance the network through a system that resembled pay-as-you-go. Instead, between 2008 and 2010, the fund received $34.4 billion in transfers from the Treasury. But in practice, the poor economic sustainability of this fund means that less and less federal money is being allocated to road and bridge maintenance and construction, leaving the states increasingly on their own in this task. But where does the money for roads and highways allocated by the states come from? And how much does this amount represent? Well, you see, states and local authorities have their own scheme to finance the roads and highways that are in their territory. In this case, they do it through another state or local fuel tax, a surcharge on top of the federal tax. They also use tolls. And of course, if the federal government contributes less and less, there are two options. Either the state and local governments raise taxes and tolls, or they leave the roads with less and less maintenance. And the fact is that some states take the first option and others take the other. But if we talk about amounts and numbers, it must be noted that in total, the United States does spend about $135 billion 
a year on roads, of which approximately $50 billion corresponds to the states via fuel taxes, and about $20 billion via tolls, so that the federal government only puts in a third of the money, about $50 billion. The dilemma in this whole story is that nobody, neither the federal government nor the states, want to touch the fuel tax, but neither do they want to repair the roads by pulling funds from general revenues. Why? Well, because that would mean taking resources away from other areas. So it's a catch-22 situation. And so it is that year after year, month after month, the roads and bridges in the United States are becoming more and more decrepit. And it's the same with the rail network. So is there a solution to this? Well, it seems that the fastest way to get the country up to date in infrastructure, or as Trump said, to rebuild the nation, is through the federal government. A massive infrastructure investment plan. Doesn't sound bad, does it? Well, that's what Joe Biden plans to do. The question is, will it work this time? Well, let's take a look. <laughs> There's a plan, again. Dear Visual Politic viewers, I am sure you all have already seen this news headline. Biden announces huge infrastructure plan to win the future, Associated Press. President Joe Biden outlines a huge $2.3 trillion plan Wednesday to re-engineer the nation's infrastructure in what he billed as a once-in-a-generation investment in America. In other words, to make it clearer, 2.3 millions of millions, 2.3 trillion in a 10-year plan. It is one of the most ambitious spending plans in the history of the country. But wait a minute, before you say, oh well, that's sorted then. They are going to pour money into roads, bridges, airports and railroads. So everything is solved. Wait, because there is some very fine print. The first thing we have to take into account is that of those $2.3 trillion, only $621 billion are for transport infrastructure. That is about $62 billion per year. And of that $621 billion, only $115 billion would go to repairing roads and bridges, about $11.5 billion a year, or just over one-fifth of what the federal government already provides through the Highway Trust Fund. So in the end, it doesn't seem like such a big change either. I remember what we said at the beginning of the video, that $786 billion was needed just to repair roads and bridges. Well, Biden's multi-billion dollar proposal would not even cover one-sixth of what experts estimate is needed. And that's not all. The outdated airports, which we mentioned earlier, would receive a mere $25 billion over 10 years. And rest assured, that won't even get them started on all the improvements they need. So basically, of all the money in the infrastructure plan, only 6% would go to repairing the road network, bridges and airports. And if we add the $80 billion planned for the intercity Amtrak rail network, it barely covers 8% of investment in what we can traditionally consider transportation infrastructure. Doesn't seem so much, does it? Well, I'm sure you're already wondering where on earth the rest of the money is going. Of the $621 billion for transportation infrastructure, Biden wants to devote a whopping $128 billion to electric cars, 28% of the budget. His idea is to shower the country with money to set up 500,000 charging stations, buy electric city buses, and equip the entire federal fleet with electric vehicles, among other things. Then there is also $100 billion to improve the electricity network, $111 billion to improve water networks, and $100 billion to extend the broadband network throughout the country. But what about the rest? So far, we've talked about $210 billion in infrastructure, $128 billion in promoting the electric car, and $311 billion in electricity, water, and internet. This adds up to $649 billion, barely 30% of the whole plan. What is the rest going to be devoted to? Well, for that, stay tuned for upcoming visual politic videos, because we will review the plan in full. But for now, what we're going to tell you is how Biden intends to fund this huge amount of money. Take a look. Biden wants to pay for infrastructure plan with 15 years of corporate taxes. The New York Times. There you have it. The centerpiece of the plan in the economic field is a corporate tax hike from 21% to 28%, which if we take into account the state surcharge would place the United States once again as the OECD and G7 country with the highest combined rate of this tax, 32.34%. In practice, this means that most of the cost will be borne by companies. I don't know if it seems like the best idea in the world, but we're already preparing a video where we analyze it in detail. On the other hand, the model is considered by some analysts as a federal recentralization of infrastructure policy, because the plan foresees that the federal government will decide on how much is spent and on what is spent, something that in the United States with its level of decentralization is not at all common. But of course, big spending requires big excuses. And in this case, Biden's excuse is the supposed creation of 19 million jobs by 2030. The problem is that when all this construction boom ends, we will have to see how many jobs will last over time, estimate how much each job has cost the public treasury, and calculate how much may have 
have been lost, may not have been created, or was put at risk because of the tax increase. However, at this point, and now that we know the current president's intentions, the question we can ask ourselves is, is there not an alternative model that could solve the US infrastructure problem without resorting to tax increases and centralization of decisions? Well, let's take a look down under. Let's see what Australia is doing. You see, Australia, also known as the United States 2.0, is implementing a new incentive system to finance its infrastructure. This model consists of the government putting infrastructure in poor condition up for sale to private operators, and using that money to invest in the new infrastructure that is needed. In this case, the advantage is twofold, because the old infrastructure is also restored by the private operator, who obtains the right to operate it. In this way, it is possible to finance a new piece of infrastructure, and at the same time, renovate the existing ones without having to resort to large tax increases. And to go even further, the model also also foresees that new infrastructure built with that money can also be sold to private parties through the same system. So the idea is that the model constantly regenerates money. Doesn't sound like a bad plan, does it? Surely this would be a far more sustainable and economically efficient option than the spending frenzy Joe Biden has proposed. In any case, it is clear that the United States needs someone to take the ball by the horns when it comes to infrastructure. What is not clear is that this plan will fulfill that purpose and do so in the best possible way. But at this point, it's your turn. Do you think that the problem of disinvestment in infrastructure in the United States has a solution? And if so, do you think that the solution lies in pouring federal money into it? Or is it time to consider new funding models? Leave your answers down in the comments below. And if you liked this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos that are coming soon. All the best and see you next time.